standing up here, and we as people of God, we shouldn't even take our speech and our conduct lightly as we walk through the world. Amen? Amen. Brethren, as we were standing here and singing to the Lord the last song, Worthy is the Lamb. Seated on the throne, we crown you now with many crowns. Sometimes my heart is broken at the fact that there's a God in heaven who has made all things. And he knows all things. And he became a man for you and I. He lived a life contrary to these bodies in which we live. For you and I. And we don't give him everything he's due. He's due honor and worthy. He's worthy of, of glory and honor. He's worthy of every breath we take. He's the author of the breath we take. And instead, we live in this generation where man is more concerned about the clothes that he wears and the cars that he drives and the houses he lives in and what man will think of him. Jesus uttered something amazing in John chapter 5, verse 44. He said, how can you believe who receive honor from one another? But do not seek the honor that comes from the only God. Brethren, I don't mean to overwhelm you with such intense emotion this morning. But I cannot help myself. Who knows, I may never get another chance again to be used by God to manifest his heart and mind in this hour. God has given me a platform this morning to speak to you in his name. And I don't want to fail him and I don't want to fail you. How many of you know there's nothing more important, nothing more important than knowing God and walking with God and pleasing God and trusting God and being confident in God? There it is written, cursed is the man who trusts in the flesh. But the man who trusts in the Lord, the man whose hope is the Lord, he's blessed. He'll be like a tree dwelling in dry places, but he'll have green leaves and he'll bear fruit in season. And he won't be afraid when... Famine comes, or when a drought comes, everything around him will be dying and dead, but there'll be a beautiful tree thriving in a harsh environment. That's what we're called to be, my brothers and sisters. We're living in an age of darkness and, and dryness, a famine of God's word, a famine of the water from the day spring on high. but we're supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to be the difference. We're supposed to be that thing that defies logic because it's Christ in us. Amen? I feel like we don't have much time in general, but in this hour this morning. I feel like there's so much on my heart that God wants to say. You know, we've only got an hour. And I could talk to you about various topics and various things. I could talk about the fact that we need to be humble before the Lord our God. And that we should not be living for ourselves. I could talk about that. I could talk about how great and good God is. And lo, He is great and good in love. I could talk about that. I could talk about how wicked the world has become. And how it's filled with violence and great unbelief. I could talk about how wicked the church has become and how violent and greatly filled with unbelief she is. How she has become a harlot and fornicates with all the kings of the earth. I could talk about this, but I have to be honest with you. I'd really rather just talk about what God wants you to hear this morning. Is that okay with you all? Is it? Am I... Correct in assuming that everybody in this room 
just wants to do the will of God, Amen. just wants to live for God, just wants to please the Lord God. Let's go before him in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this place. Lord God, for all your blessings and provision and your protection. Lord, we still live in a nation where we can do this out in the open. We can have these Bibles that you've given us and read them out loud. Lord, we're not losing our heads in this nation yet. And we thank you for that. It's not yet illegal to possess this book we're getting ready to preach out of. It's not yet illegal to gather together like this, and we thank you, Lord. And Father, we just come before you humbly. We humble ourselves in your sight this morning, and we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would equip us, that you would correct us, that you would bless us with, your, with the reality of your presence. Lord, whether we feel you or not, you're here. Whether you display your power or not, we know you are all powerful. We just seek you, Lord. We want to hear what you have to say to us this day. And Lord, I humble myself before you and before your people. And I ask that you would speak through me words that would transform, words that would change, words that would bring life, words that would bring light, health, peace, words that would bring revelation of Jesus Christ. And that everybody sitting here in this place this morning and those who will watch this will never be the same. And that they would have great faith in Jesus Christ. Father, in your holy name, we give you thanks. Amen. I feel as though I have a title for this message. And I trust it will be appropriate by the end. A modern exodus. A modern exodus. We're, we're in a modern exodus. What do I mean by that? Well, we can take a look at what Moses led the people of God through after he delivered them mightily out of the land of Egypt. They walked through a desert. Though the first generation of those Israelites did not get to see the promised land, But we are in that kind of exodus right now. Are we not journeying through the desert of this age, the desert of this world, this world of sin and death? Are we not journeying towards our heavenly home? Are we not pilgrims and strangers on the earth? Are we not sojourners dwelling in this tent, journeying toward our home, whose builder and maker is God? Brothers and sisters, we're in a modern exodus. And as Moses was leader of that nation of Israel, so Jesus Christ is our leader. Just as Moses was for them the way, the truth, and the life, the power to deliver them, the mouthpiece of God, so Jesus is also our way, our truth, and our life. But he's not just our way, our truth, and our life. He's the way for all of mankind. What a sad story I could tell you about today. That God became a man. He came to his own creation, and his own creation received him not. I don't know about you, but do you realize the tragedy of this? That the one who has made all things and formed all things by the word of his power, everything, all elements of creation, seen and unseen, were first existing in the heart of God. And he made it all. He set in motion all cycles and seasons, all the laws that govern this realm. He forms the children in the mother's womb. And he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. There is good news. To as many as received him, to as many as embraced him, to as many who, who saw him for who he was, he gave them the right, he gave them the power to become children of God who were born, 
not of the will of man, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God. What a miracle that we can be born again. Nicodemus found this perplexing, and he said to the Lord Jesus Christ, How can a man be born again? Can he enter a second time? Can he enter again into his mother's womb and be reborn? Jesus said, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Our rebirth is a miracle. Our rebirth can only occur, though, out of a revelation, number one, of Jesus Christ. All at the very same moment we catch a revelation of who Jesus is and a revelation of what and who we really are without him. We must come to understand the severity of sin. For if we do not, we shall never understand the great price that our Lord Jesus paid for us. If we don't catch a revelation of evil, we'll never understand the price that God Almighty paid to free us from the power of sin and death. Because for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we are free from the law of sin and death. Amen? For those of us who are in Christ, we are free from the power of darkness. We are free from corruption. We're free from wrong attitudes, wrong desires, stinking thinking. And in this generation, there's a great departure, a great departure, a great falling away from the understanding of why Jesus came in the first place. It is written of him in Matthew 1, verse 21, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And my friends, sin in the human heart is the working of the devil. And Jesus came to abolish death, to abolish sin in our bodies, in our hearts, and in our minds. Can I tell you something? You might find this a little controversial, but Jesus didn't come to save us from hell. He came to save us from the very force itself that would lead us to that place. He came to save us from our sin. Maybe those of you here, both of you listening, are wondering why you're talking about this. We already know it. I don't think we do. I'm not convinced of it in my own life that I have a great. I need a greater understanding of these elementary things. You know, the modern church talks about we need to get back to the Book of Acts. We need to get back to all those things that we read about. But can I tell you, this shall not occur until we first get back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Until we first get back to who Jesus Christ is, what he says, what he expects. Those other things will surely come. a little compelled to tell you just a little bit about myself this morning. Some of you have no idea really anything about me except that I attend church here. Some of you have no idea where I came from. I want to summarize that. I don't want to spend too much time on that this morning. But I feel it's necessary you understand that before Jesus Christ rescued my life, I was a pagan through and through. I hated the name of Jesus. I hated church. I hated Christianity. I hated the cross. I hated it all. To me, in my mind, it was a bunch of nonsense that some religious folk created centuries ago to control the minds of the masses. 
Therefore, I said, I have no part of that nonsense. I'll find God in my own ways. Oh, I knew there was a God. Something within me, God put something within me that allowed me to realize that this is not an accident, this, all, all this stuff. The trees and the streams and the birds, everything, all of creation proves there's a God. Is it not written, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Yes, it is written. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. So God put it within me to realize that there's a creator. And he also put it within my heart to realize if there is a creator, then I've got to know him. Then I must be accountable to him. I need to find out who he is. I didn't believe it was the God of Christianity. And I didn't believe that God became a man and his name was Jesus. Oh, I historically nodded my head at the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was a real man. No, I didn't think he was a Messiah. Nor did I think that mm, he even died on a cross. Honestly, maybe that's for another day, the strangeness of my beliefs. So I began to study other religions. I even studied Islam for a while. I studied Buddhism, I studied Hinduism. And then I just tried to take uh, the things in all those religions that sounded about right and just put them together into one doctrine. Man, hey, I thought I had it all figured out, man. Yeah, I got this. Now I can eat, drink, and be merry and adhere to some of those principles and all is well. God is pleased with this. That, that was who I was. And I was still yet a slave to corruption, a slave to sexual immorality, a slave to my emotions, a slave to my unclean desires and passions. I was a slave to whom I didn't realize at the time, the devil himself. I had haunting and tormenting dreams, devilish demonic dreams of what I understand to be now the fallen host of heaven tormenting me, instilling fear within me, conforming me to the unholy nature of the devil himself. I was a slave. But something within me, God himself, stirred me up and put a hook in my mouth and began to draw me to him. That was not an easy process for me or my wife. A lot of things happened to us in that period of time that challenged us greatly. Our marriage was this close to failing. I contemplated suicide several times. I hated life. I hated people. And I was just wishing that sometime during the day somebody would say the wrong thing to me so that I could vent some anger. Lost a job, lost, we weren't paying a mortgage, but we had to break the lease, so we essentially lost the house. We had to give up the house we were living in. We had to move in with family. We were at a type of rock bottom, you might say. But all the while, there was something occurring in my heart. I knew that the God who made all things was drawing me to himself. I knew in the midst of all that insanity, something was happening. And I found peace in that. I, I was able to find peace in all that madness because I knew that the one who made me in my mother's womb was bringing me to himself. And I can look back and realize all the way that that God comforted me in our trials and afflictions, even though they were self-induced, sin-induced. What mercy our God has upon us. Amen? I used to use psychedelic drugs, not recreationally, but in a, in a means, in an attempt to understand the universe, understand things, to try and draw close to the God of heaven. And I'll tell you, one night, one early morning, at about 4.30 in the morning, I was under the influence of LSD, this might be a foreign experience to some of you out there. And it 
Before this night, I'm telling you, God had me primed and ready for what was about to happen to me early that morning. See, God had brought me to the feet of Jesus. But he first had to allow me to go through all the darkness and find out who he was not. Like a process of elimination, you might say. Well, that's not the God of heaven. That's not his teaching. That's not his ideology. That, that doesn't align with what I see out there in creation. And little by little, breaking down strongholds. Little by little, breaking down false ideas, false interpretations, false understandings of the Holy Bible. Allowing me to see the corruption that does exist. Not only in this United States government, but all the governments of the world. That they are all just puppets in the hands of principalities and powers. Every area of society, every level of society, you better believe it, is controlled by Satan. Every area. And he allowed me to see all that. And it was all for a purpose. Because at that 4.30 in the morning, in the month of November... 2011. I was listening. All that brought me to a place of a man who used to be involved. I was listening to his testimony. A man who used to be involved in blatant, blatant devil worship, you might say. He knew he, who he was serving. He had come out of it. God had rescued him. And I was listening to his testimony. And something happened in my heart. When he began to talk about what Jesus Christ did in his heart and how he delivered him from the oppression of the devil, something happened in my heart. I fell on my face crying and weeping. I fell on my face crying. All the effects of the LSD gone in the twinkling of an eye. Sober. Crying before God, saying, Jesus, it is you. Jesus, it is you. Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord God, for that thing, that one that I had been looking for the whole time. I was at his feet. And I had to go the long way around, it would seem, to wind back up at the feet of the one who bought me with his own blood. Hallelujah. What a God. Think about this. We understand the Lord. He owns the earth. He's the Lord God of all flesh. He's the God of all spirits. All things are subject unto Him. Why would He have to buy His creation back? Think about that. I mean, you've heard about people kidnapping a politician's son or a rich person's son, and they demand a ransom. Oh, I'll give you your son back. I'll give you your stuff back if you give me. That's what God did for us. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. God shed his blood. He became a man. He gave up his life to buy his own stuff back. You and I and all of creation and it is written concerning this kind of love in 1 John. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We also ought to lay down our lives to the uttermost that God could save a few. For this is love, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Jesus said this concerning this agape love, this love of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13, he said, This is my new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. As I, that is the key verse. Let's go there. John, chapter 13. I want you to see this. John chapter 13, verse 33, beginning at verse 34, pardon me. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. 
as I have loved you. My brothers and sisters, those are big shoes to fill. Listen to me, that is impossible. We cannot love how Jesus loved. Do you understand this? It is not possible in our flesh. It is not possible while operating in the carnal nature. We must be born again. We must receive the nature of Jesus Christ, the grace of God. To love like this, to forgive others when we are spitefully mistreated, to forgive others when we are blatantly wronged and transgressed against. To still, in a figurative way, send the sun on the evil and rain on the unjust as Jesus does. For Jesus says, it is written, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? And he goes on to say, therefore you shall be perfect. And that word perfect is not without fault. It means to be mature. Therefore you shall be Perfect. You shall be mature in love as your heavenly Father is also mature in love. For He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. Do you understand this? And it is this kind of love that the church has fallen away from. It is this elementary principle of Christ that there is a great departure from. Jesus said the love of many will grow cold because lawlessness abounds. Sin. John says in his first epistle, sin is lawlessness to be without law. It's no coincidence to me that we hear among the false grace messages and the uh, false love messages. We're not under the law, we're under grace. You're absolutely right. However, they have allowed a lying spirit to come in and twist the definitions of these words. For the law is good and the commandment is holy and just. Jesus came that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. He said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, he said, I say unto you, that until heaven and earth pass away one jot, one comma, one I, one, one dot above the I, one jot or one tittle, one semicolon, shall not pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Therefore, he says, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And he finishes by saying, For assuredly I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And those dudes thought they were pretty righteous. But see, we're talking about a righteousness that comes by faith. We're not talking about a righteousness that is worked by the adherence to the letter, it's impossible. For God does he not require truth in the inward parts. That's a problem for us. To be changed on the inside, my brothers and sisters, is what Jesus came for. Because inherently there is the problem inside of us. In the inner man, that's where the cancer is. That's where the remission of sin does take place. It's 
So beware of those who speak so arrogantly and harshly against the moral laws of God and the written words of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you must love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. Now, verse 35. He says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. But this is not just any kind of love, my friends. This is the love of God. We could effectively say, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love, parentheses, the love of God for one another. That's what he's saying. How do we love one another? How do we love our enemies? As Jesus Christ has and does. It's impossible for us. Is it not, Brother Jeremy? It's impossible in the flesh. What is the solution? Glorious death. Death to Mark Moore. Death to self. Because is that not what our Lord Jesus has thus done for us? Laid down his life for us. He said it himself. He said, for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Your word is truth. My brothers and sisters, I say to you today, that same Jesus who prayed that prayer some 2,000 years ago, praying in that garden that no doubt Pastor Mike will visit very shortly, on his face, sweating as it were great drops of blood, in the middle of giving birth to the perfect will of God, travailing, saying, Father, I pray that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. For this is eternal life, that they may know you. That same Jesus lives in you and I. We've been born by His Holy Spirit. And John says in his epistle, if anybody says he abides in Him, then he himself ought to walk just as He walked. And if Jesus laid down His life every moment of every day to take up the will of the Father, you better believe He's going to do it again and again and again and again through you and me to all this madness on the earth is done that He might save a few that he might save a few. Don't you understand that our conduct, our speech, the way we live our lives is going to play a big part in people that get right with God. Paul said to Timothy, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. For in doing so, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. We can't save man, but God through us can. Hear me. God working through you and I can. Listen, we're not all called to preach in a pulpit. Not all are apostles, not all are prophets, not all are evangelists, not all are teachers, but we have all been called. We have all been mandated to be conformed to the nature of Jesus. And in that process, you better believe your will, your purpose that God has ordained for you will be fulfilled in that place. We're all called to die. We're all called to die. And in that death to self, the purpose that God has for you will blossom and you will become that very thing that you were designed to be. If a coffee pot had a personality, what a blessed coffee pot he would be if he understood his function and just did it. Right. 
A born-again hammer is very happy just to be a hammer. A born-again drill is very happy just to drill in some screws, my friends. Just be happy. Let us just be happy being the one thing that God has designed us to be. It don't matter what we are called to be. Let's just do it with gladness and simplicity in our heart. Amen? But we live in a generation, an hour, where everybody thinks they need to have the limelight. Where everybody thinks they need to be seen and heard and revered and patted on the back and told how wonderful and good and unique and special they are. And I'm not attempting to take away the fact that God has made us all unique. God has made us all special. God has formed us for His purpose. But we're seeking all the wrong things, my friends. I feel as though I've deviated a little from the message I thought that we'd be speaking today. And that's okay. Perhaps this is what the Lord intended, a message like this. Love. But not carnal love. Not a selfish love. There is a love that damns the soul of man. There is a wrong kind of love. I could have a love for my wife that is dangerous. My wife could have a love for me that is dangerous. What do you mean? If I had a dangerous kind of love for my wife, what that means to me is that my love for her would be of the nature that I wouldn't do or say anything so as to... um, Ruin my right standing with her, regardless if it was beneficial for her or not. I could be more concerned about what my wife thinks and feels rather than what God thinks or feels. I could be more concerned about my coworkers and what they think and what they feel rather than what God says, thinks, or feels. You understand this? It's guaranteed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry in the sense that it has to be this way for us. But Jesus said the world will hate you because it hated me. Paul said to the Corinthians, the more I love, the more you hate. The more I love you, the more you hate me. No man, no woman has ever loved so perfectly except Jesus of Nazareth. And look what they did to him. But hallelujah, they couldn't keep him dead. I got this cartoon at home from my son Emmett about the resurrection of Jesus. And in it they've got uh, Caiaphas and and, uh, Pilate talking with one another. And Caiaphas said, it cost me so much to get him killed, now it's going to cost me even more to keep him dead. The world will go to great lengths to cover up the truth of Jesus. Why is that? Why is that we're living in an age where the world around us, the politicians and the lawmakers around us, the social figureheads, the franchise, the faces of the franchises of this age are going to great lengths to get rid of anything that looks like, smells like, tastes like Jesus Christ out of our culture, out of our society, out of our public education system, out of every area and sect of society, there is a conspiracy against the name and the person of Jesus Christ. Yet, Mohammed is allowed to go and do forth whatever he feels, right? Buddha, all the gods of Hinduism, the god of self even, principles, philosophies, ideas, they're all allowed to, however much you want, in excess. Oh, but don't you dare start talking about that Jesus of the Holy Bible. This to me was a great thing to behold in my my time of being estranged from Christ. 
It's something that God allowed me to see that the whole world hates the name of Jesus. Now, let's be honest, there's a good reason in this age. Because there's a lot of people who go by the name of Jesus that bring a reproach to his name and his character and this word. God, did he not say, my name is blasphemed among the Gentiles or the unbelievers because of you, hypocrites. You whitewashed tombs. You who cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but have neglected the inside of the cup and dish. He said, fools and hypocrites, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside will be clean also. Hallelujah. God does not like hypocrisy. And my brothers and sisters, there's something inside of me that just wants to prove Jesus. I just want to prove that this book is true, and that every word written in it shall not return void. I want to prove that. Because the God who made sure that this thing is in our hands has saved my life. He has made himself real to me. And I want to do everything I can to offer a compelling case by the Spirit and wisdom of God to prove that Jesus of Nazareth is who he says he is, that he's done what he said he's done, and that he's going to come back again and destroy that image of the Antichrist that man is worshiping in the earth at this hour. Behold, I tell you a great mystery. Just as Moses ascended the mountain and he left the Israelites at the foot of the mountain. And he went up to be with God. Just as Jesus of Nazareth has thus ascended to the right hand of the Heavenly Father, just as those Israelites formed and fashioned the God of their own understanding and a made and formed and fashioned a God of their own understanding that would allow them to live any way they please. So the people of God in this hour also, while the King of Kings is up on the holy mountain of God, have formed and fashioned another God, and they put the name of Jesus on it, and this Jesus allows them to live and do and think and be however they please. And when Jesus comes back down off of that mountain, he's going to destroy some stuff. No, Moses did it as a man in the flesh. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. But I can tell you this, that the wrath of God does produce righteousness in man. Those Israelites had a problem with complaining, didn't they, Brother Dave? They were not content with anything. At one point, they're quoted as saying, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. My brothers and sisters, the same thing is happening amongst the people of God this day. They say about the written word of God, our soul loathes this worthless bread. Give us something else. Let us just go back to Egypt so we can have all the delights and things of Egypt. We don't care that we were slaves. Let us just go back and have those comforts, those pleasures. It is written in Hebrews chapter 11 that if they had called to mind that city that they had come from, they would have opportunity to return. But now they're journeying towards a heavenly home whose builder and maker is God. Brethren, let any man thinks, any man who thinks that he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. We can walk away from God. We can depart from the living God. We can as Michael was saying earlier, be weighed down with the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things, entering in, choke the word.
Paul, who I believe wrote the book of Hebrews, said, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We're going to walk it out. We've got to work out what God has worked in. I wonder if any of you are about to understand what I'm going to say. Is anybody in here familiar with what a zip file is? A few of you are. It's a way of storing information in a computer. And you put this zip file on your computer, and you unzip it. And inside, you'll probably have applications or other programs or information that you want to put on a hard drive of that computer. You understand our salvation? which is in Christ Jesus, is sort of like that zip file. We can get that zip file put in the hard drive of our soul. But unless we unzip that thing and begin to install the applications and open it up, it does us absolutely no good. And it is all zipped up in here, in this book, my friends. We have got to unzip this word and begin to install it on our systems. We must. Listen, Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. David said, concerning the word of God, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And I say to you today, how can an old man, how can an old woman cleanse their way? By taking heed according to the word of God. It matters not your age, your nationality, your background. Let us not grow weary. Let us not ever come to the place where we think we have arrived. We might say, we might confess with our mouth, I know I'm not perfect, I know I've not arrived, but somehow we deceive ourselves in thinking that we don't have to labor in the Word, that we don't have to strive to enter the narrow gate. Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. Brothers and sisters, that might sound like an easy thing, but we have to develop our faith. Jesus said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Unless you eat His words and drink His Spirit, you have no life in you, is what He said. It's what He said. Is it, is it really that narrow? I feel like it is. I believe it is. And honestly, I don't even want to play around and try to find out by the process of elimination. There was a man on Facebook who commented on a post I had done months ago. And he was basically saying that the fear of God is not for today. Now, we don't have to fear God any longer. And he gave, you know, a very nice, educated reason why. Very lengthy, very wordy, very intelligent, very deceptive. But because, by the grace of God, the Word is alive and active and flowing through the veins of my soul, oh, I could see it for what it was. A doctrine of a devil. And so... I tried to reason with him scripturally, and there was none. You can't reason with that kind of a spirit. And I said, okay, I'm not going to say his name. You go ahead and practice your faith in that way, like you're just prescribing to me. Go ahead and do those things that you just said, and I'm going to continue to go ahead and do what I see written in this holy book. And I'll see you on Judgment Day, where you end up and where I end up. It's that tangible to me. There are doctrines at work in the church that if you adhere to them, you will lose your soul. You will. Oh, it's so very subversive, so, so cunning and crafty, so slight, just a, ever so, such a slight manipulation, a slight tweaking, but just enough 
to throw you off course. Little by little by little until at the end of your life, you're way over there wondering, how oh, in God's name that I get over here. And beware, because Esau sought repentance through tears, and it was not granted unto him, because he had seared his conscience as with a hot iron. So I could just summarize everything right now and say, no, I don't believe that once you're saved or you're born again, that you're good to go for all eternity. Absolutely not. Truthfully, I don't understand how a man, if he's after truth and he just wants to live right, how he can read this book and never come to that conclusion. Paul said in the first chapter, the second chapter of Romans, eternal life is for those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Jesus said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. He who overcomes, but overcomes what? Sin, death, unbelief, bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, selfishness, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. He overcomes all this. Oh, he'll inherit all things. My brothers and sisters, I can't think of a more noble fight. I can't think of a, 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 more, a greater thing to pour our life into than following God making it home, and bringing as many with us as we can, knowing full well that this earth is passing away. Everything within it and the lusts of it are passing away. But he who does the will of God abides forever. It is written. John said, Do not love the world or the things in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. You know what that means? Everything in this earth will be burned up with fire. The objects of people's earthly affections will perish, and the desire for them themselves will perish. No longer... There will be a day when you no longer desire sexual gratification. There will be a day when you no longer hunger and thirst for a steak and a beer. There will be a day when you no longer desire to sleep in on a Saturday morning. It will all pass away. Do you think that the people in hell right now care one bit about the size of their television, about the car they drive, about their honor and right standing in the sight of men. They don't care one lick about it. Because the desires for those things for them have already come to pass away. This is a severe hour we're living in. Deception like never before, never shall there be again. What are we going to do about it, saints? What are we going to do about it? We're all called to do something. We're called to be light. We're called to be salt. We're all called to be disciples. We're all called to walk the way of the master. We're all called to hide this word of God in our heart. No, we're not all called to memorize it like some do and some can. But we are called to abide in his word. To abide in the, branch, in the vine as a branch. We're all called to do that. And I can guarantee you, only because this book does, only because the author, the inspiration for this book does, that if we do that, we will fulfill the purpose that God has for us. 
We won't have to try to intellectually figure out what God's wanting us to do or to say. We'll just do it and say it because we'll be walking in the conformity of his nature. That is our salvation, really, truly. Being conformed unto the nature of Jesus Christ, to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. When God comes in all of his glory, he's looking for those who look like act like, think like, reason like his son Jesus. So therefore let us not be like those ancient Israelites who complained and grumbled and were never satisfied. Who were trying instead to please desires that are passing away. Wanting earthly things only, minding only earthly things. Lest we perish in this desert of this modern age, as we surely will. Let us not be like those Israelites who complained, griped and moaned, and sought to please only self, and were bitten by serpents, who were poisoned with bitterness and selfishness, our answer is always to look to Jesus. Let us not lose sight. That's going to be the battle in this era. Keeping our eyes fixed upon Jesus. It is written that the Antichrist will make war with the saints. And it is given to him to overcome them. He's at war with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. How is he going to overcome the saints? Can I ask you that? And I'll tell you what I think. Believe the spirit of Antichrist will overcome the saints. First, socially. Disable the people of God from being effective in the social arena. People won't want to hear anything about Jesus. He'll overcome them with putting a yoke upon their shoulders, of having to work such hard jobs, making them tired, making them weary, forcing them to provide for their families to an extent that they're nearly disabled from propagating the gospel. And it is written, it is given to him to overcome them for a time. But something will happen, my brothers and sisters. If we stay faithful, if we hide the word of God in our hearts and continue to do what we're told to do, something will happen. For God is going to do something. God is going to show off, you might say. God's going to prove his word is true. God's going to prove what he said through his apostles and prophets. And our only place of safety is in Him. We're going to be confronted with great evil, bodily harm even, hunger at times in this nation. Our only place of safety is in the name of the Lord, is in Him, walking as He walked. And I'll tell you a little prophetically right now that those who are walking in the flesh right now, it doesn't matter if they're in the house of God or not, those who are walking in the carnal nature will find themselves at the wrong place at the wrong time because they've been living for the wrong reasons. But those who are walking in the Spirit will find themselves at the right place at the right time for the right reasons because they've been living for the right reasons. You understand? Therefore, let us walk in the Spirit. Okay? I know I've got to close, but I had already purposed in my heart to share with you this writing. You might call it a poem. And it's called The Words of God. I'm going to read it to you. The everlasting God, He who is without beginning, nor does He have an end, the Ancient of Days, the Maker of all things, seen and unseen, the Almighty Lord, the One who has made all things for Himself, and set in motion 
all laws and cycles and seasons. These things he has done by the word of his power and upholds it all by his words, through his words, that is, his son Jesus. His words are powerful and true. His word is life. His word is potent and always relevant. When he says, let there be, there is. While when he says it shall come to pass, it does. And when he says it is so, it is just as he states, from beginning to end, now and forevermore. It is so that all things in this realm are passing away. Yes, man is in this earthly form but a vapor. Indeed, dust in the wind, like the grass of the fields. And all the excellence of man is only but as a flower of that field. The grass does wither. The flower fades and falls. Its beautiful appearance does perish. But the word of God is eternal. At times, his word is like a sword piercing our beings, dividing soul and spirit, revealing to ourself the motives in our own heart. It is like a sword cutting away the lies from the truth, slaying the wickedness in us and around us. At times his word is like mother's milk, and as newborn babes we desire the pure milk of the word, and we thus grow thereby. At times his word is like honey, sweet in our mouth and belly. At times, his word is like natural medicine, which he sends forth and it heals us, giving us life to our flesh and strength to our bones. At times, his word is like fresh water drawn straight from his everlasting well of salvation. From his river of life we drink, quenching our dry soul and are satisfied. Yet also, it is like clean, pristine and pure water washing us, cleansing us, and sanctifying us. At times his word is bitter, for he must judge wickedness. And as John did eat the scroll that was given him by the angel, though sweet in his mouth it was, it left a bitter tone in his belly. At times his word is like light, indeed like a lamp, giving light to the path before us and causing us to understand the mysterious workings around us. At times his word is like thunder, rumbling, shaking the souls of men and the things in heaven. At times his word is like bread, sustaining us, feeding us, and satisfying us. This is the bread that man can live on. At times his word is like meat, satisfying the urge within, giving us brute strength of faith to do the will of God. Sometimes his word is like drinking wine fermented with the fruits of righteousness, giving us joy and happiness. Sometimes his word is like a plow, breaking up the fallow and rocky ground of our idle and hard hearts. Sometimes his word is like a seed. It is spoken into the soil of our hearts and takes a while to sprout up, but it does grow within. Sometimes his word is like yeast, which is hidden in our hearts and causes his kingdom to expand upward and outward within us. <clears throat> At times the word of God is like wheat, which is used to prepare bread for the eater and seed to the sower. At times the word of God is like a lamb, so mild and gently restoring us. Yet at times his word is like a lion, so bold and strong, sobering us up and correcting us. At times the word of God is like salt, changing the flavor of things and preserving things and healing things. At times the word of God is like bricks or blocks. We build a wall around our hearts and lives with it, and we build a house on the rock of truth with it and are safe. At times the word of the Lord is like a battle axe, <clears throat> hacking away at falsehood and deceit. Sometimes his word is like a tool in the hands of a trusted servant to uproot and replant, a tool to tear down and to build up. At times, the word of God is that piece of truth that gloriously liberates us from the power of darkness altogether. Sometimes the word of God is like rain or snow, softening and feeding the soil of our hearts. It is absorbed into the depths of our soul, and a deep unseen purpose is accomplished within us. It causes us to bring forth in bud beauty and purpose, like glorious flowers of heaven, like wheat for bread and seed to sow more, 
herbs and fruits to eat, yet not just for us, but for others also. Always, though, the word of God is like a vine, which we must abide in as a branch, lest we not bear fruit. At times, the word of God is like fire, a fire which incinerates and burns away the stubble of worthlessness, the impurities that are within us, and the filth of sin. Even at times, his word is like a flaming sword, guarding the way before us, preventing us from going forward until we allow ourselves to be slain by the sword of fire, for out of this death and purging we can partake of the tree of life. And at times the word of God is like a hammer, a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces, a hammer that breaks the rock hard hearts, a hammer that destroys the rock walls of lies and strongholds of evil, breaking apart the rocky foundations of sin and unbelief, breaking in pieces the rock of wickedness altogether. No matter what, and at all times, the word of God is everlasting and pure, always accomplishing that for which he is sent out to do. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word which you've left behind for us, for your spirit that you've given to us, for your blood that you've shed for us. Oh, dear God, we thank you for the light that you bring into our life. And Lord, I pray that you would use something uttered today to equip your people, to perfect your people, to help save the laws, to bring the revelation of Jesus Christ, to increase faith and impart grace. And dear God, I ask that you would be glorified in our hearts and minds and in our bodies, and that you would enable every last one of us to live for you and not for self. In your holy name, Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and honor. Amen. May the grace of our Lord.